Hello everyone, happy St. Patrick's Day. I hope you're all making the best of your time off and at home. I wanted to come and read you a book for the next couple days called If Your Name Was Changed at Ellis Island. So St. Patrick's Day is a holiday that we celebrate here in the United States, but originated in Ireland, but came to be the excitement that it is because of Irish immigrants in the United States. So I figured this book would be an awesome book to share with you about people immigrating to the United States and what that looked like for them. This is near and dear to me because one of my grandparents actually came through Ellis Island when he came from Poland, but my name is Callahan and I do have Irish ancestors too, so it's super cool to share that. So this book is called If Your Name Was Changed at Ellis Island. It is an informational text, which means it's going to be chock full of facts and interesting things about Ellis Island. Introduction. America has always been a nation of immigrants, people who have moved to the United States from other countries. Even if the first Americans, the Indians, are to believe have crossed the Bering Strait over a strip of land that once connected North America with Asia thousands and thousands of years ago. When the 13 colonies were first settled, most immigrants came from England, Holland, and France. Soon there were Scandinavians, Welsh, Scots, Scotch-Irish, Irish, and Germans. As early as 1643, a French priest visiting New Amsterdam, which later became New York City, said that 18 different languages could be heard spoken on the city streets. By the end of the 1800s, Italians, Poles, Armenians, Russians, and others from the Southern and Eastern Europe began to pour into America. On the West Coast, Chinese and Japanese immigrants arrived. It was the greatest human migration in history. We don't really know exactly how many people came, because for long periods of time there were no records kept. And when they were, only some people were counted, not others. We do know that nearly 35 million people came to America in the 100 years from the 1820s to 1924. In that year, strict immigration laws were passed to limit the number of people who could enter the country. For most of the newcomers, the trip was very difficult, often dangerous. They traveled weeks, sometimes months, only to arrive in a place where they didn't speak the language. Often they had nowhere to live and little money, yet they poured into America. This book is about their journey, their hopes and difficulties, and their adventures. It tells the stories mainly of those immigrants who came through New York Harbor from the 1880s until 1914 when World War I began and the Great Migration ended. For these immigrants, America was their destination, but Ellis Island was their first stop. What was Ellis Island? Ellis Island was an immigration center located in New York Harbor. Millions of newcomers passed through its gates and were examined by doctors and legal inspectors. Some were allowed to enter the United States right away, some were detained or held for a while, and some were deported, which is rejected and sent back to their home country. Before Ellis Island opened, immigrants had met immigrants had been examined at Castle Garden at the tip of Manhattan Island. At one time, Castle Garden had been a fort, then a concert hall. In 1855, it was turned into an immigration center. 35 years later, it was no longer big enough to handle the thousands of new immigrants arriving daily. So the U.S. government then decided to use a small piece of land in New York Harbor known as Ellis Island for a new immigration center. The Ellis Island station opened in 19, excuse me, 1892. During the next 30 years, more people came to America than at any other time. At least 12 million of them passed through Ellis Island. Did all immigrants come through Ellis Island? Most immigrants came to America through Ellis Island, but not all. Some entered through other East Coast ports in Boston, Philadelphia, or Baltimore southern or western ports like New Orleans and Galveston, or west coast cities like San Francisco. In 1907, the year when more immigrants came to the United States than any other, there were 70 immigration stations, but 90% of all newcomers came through Ellis Island. Not all immigrants who arrived in New York had to go through Ellis Island. If you had the most expensive tickets on the ship, you 
were in first or second class. Immigration inspectors examined you while you were aboard the ship in the harbor. If you passed inspection, you were free to enter the country when the boat docked in New York. Only the poor who traveled in third class or steerage, the cheapest way to travel, were taken to Ellis Island. Why did people leave their homelands? Some people left because of a catastrophe, like an earthquake or famine. In Ireland, for example, a ter terrible disease in the mid-1800s destroyed the main farm crop, potatoes, for several years in a row. The famine lasted many years. Nearly two million people died of starvation. Almost as many people left for America. When there was a famine in Sweden in the 1860s, whole villages packed up and came to America. Millions of immigrants fled for other reasons. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, thousands of Russian Jews were killed in terrible pogroms, which were massacres and often organized by the government and sometimes even by churches. More than two million Jews left Russia and Eastern Europe because of these pogroms as well as other kinds of religious persecution. Thousands of people fled their country for other reasons. Many left to avoid being rounded up into their government's army and forced to serve for many years. Others who had fought to overthrow their country's dictator lost and then had to flee. Some left because of sickness at home. A deadly flu epidemic in Turkey, for example, drove many people from their homes. Most people left because they couldn't earn a living in their country. Newly invented factory machines replaced many workers. New farm techniques and machinery also put many farmers out of work. Also, as people flocked from the countryside to the cities, they lived in crowded and poor conditions. They left for America, hoping to find work and a better life. Why did people come to America? Many people believed that America was the golden land, a place where you could get a decent job, go to a free school, and eat well. There was a saying in Polish that people came to America, zaszewem, for blood, sorry, for bread. One person added they came for bread with butter. In Russia, six-year-old Alec Bodanis was told that in America you'll become a millionaire in no time. Take a shovel with you because they shovel gold from the streets. No one knows how these stories began, but Margot Matyshek, age 11, when she left Germany, had also heard that in America, the streets are paved with gold, and if you wish for candy, it drops from the sky right into your mouth. Some people came to look for work. Wages were higher in America than in their home countries. Until the late 1800s, businesses often sent agents overseas to encourage workers to migrate. If you agreed to work for their companies, they would pay your way to America. Many people came because it was, the land was cheap and plentiful. In 1862, the U.S. government passed a law called the Homestead Act. Newcomers could stake claim to 160 acres of land. After five years of living and working on the land, they'd pay a small amount of money and the acres would be theirs. Railroad companies also owed a great deal of land in the West. They sent agents to foreign countries offering this land for sale at good prices. Some governments of the new western states advertised in European newspapers about their growing towns and cheap farmland. They wanted new settlers. Often the advertisements were not true. They showed pictures of towns that didn't exist and gave descriptions of farm fields where forests stood. But people came anyway, searching, always searching for a better life. A Swedish song had these words about America. Ducks and children rain right down, a roasted goose flies in, and on the table lands one more with a knife and fork stuck in. Who could find a better place? Did every immigrant come voluntarily? No. In 1619, a year before the pilgrims landed at Pilgrim Rock, Plymouth Rock, the first shipload of 20 black slaves arrived at Jamestown, Virginia. For more than 200 years, slaves were kidnapped from Africa and sold in America. They were immigrants, but they didn't come from their own free will. They were enslaved. Not all people came as slaves. Some chose to come. 
Later, many arrived from different Caribbean islands. They came for the same reason most people did, to make a better life. Would everyone in your family come together? Most families did not come together. Often, a father or an older brother or sister would come first. That person would find work and send back money to the old country to bring others over. For most families, it took at least a year to be reunited. For others, 10 or more years. If you were very young when your father left, you might not even recognize him when you finally got to America. Sometimes your relative or friend in America made arrangements with a bank or a railroad or a steamship company to send you the tickets and the money for your trip. Then you would have to get to the seaport where your ship sailed from. What did people bring with them? Usually whatever they could carry. Some had suitcases and trunks. Most had bundles tied together with string. People carried baskets, cardboard boxes, tins, leather sacks, any type of container you could imagine. They brought their feather quilts, mattresses, and pillows for the steamships just provided thin blankets. They packed fancy clothes, specially embroidered and crocheted. Sometimes people who wore layers, sometimes people wore layers all of their clothing so they wouldn't have to pack them. Often they brought food for the long trip over the ocean, like smoked sausages or hams, or other foods they thought they couldn't get in America. Many people had to sell or give away almost everything they owned in order to travel to the new land. But some things they were able to bring their favorite things. One young girl mailed her dolls to her relative in America before she came. Another bought a book of fairy tales and she carried it in a basket tightly for the whole trip. So I'm going to stop there for today. I hope you enjoyed and I hope you come back to watch my next part of if you if your name was changed at Ellis Island.